In Iran, international delegations continue to arrive in Tehran to attend to President Ibrahim Raisi's funeral. Those arriving join millions of Iranians honoring the memory of Raisi. In Palestine, Israeli occupation forces committed six massacres against Palestinian families in Gaza. In Venezuela, the Bolivarian government and China signed new cooperation agreements to strengthen trade, investment and strategic development. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Lesus Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. More delegations continue to arrive in Tehran for the funerals of President Ebrahim Raisi and his eight comrades who died Sunday in a helicopter crash. Qatar's Amir Sheikh Tamim and the foreign ministers of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Kuwait arrived in Iran's capital on Wednesday to pay respect to the deceased. Other regional leaders are also in attendance, such as the Tunisian President Kais Saied, Iraqi Prime Minister Mohammed Shia al Sudani, Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan, and Egyptian Foreign Minister Ismail Shukri. In this context, the leader of the Islamic Revolution, Ayatollah Sayed Ali Khamenei, led the prayers over the bodies of President Ibrahim Raisi and his comrades in the presence of millions of people accompanying the funeral procession. The eight coffins of the victims of the helicopter crash were received by local people and representatives of international religious delegations at the University of Tehran. The martyrs were mourned by attendants with flowers, pictures and pledges of eternal loyalty, with the crowd also expressing messages of solidarity with the Palestinian cause. Venezuelan foreign minister Ivan Hill attended the funeral of President Ibrahim Raisi, Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Tolahayan, and the members of the entourage who died on Sunday, May 19th, in the helicopter accident. On the social media, ex the head of the Venezuelan diplomacy said he was attending the state funeral on behalf of President Nicolas Maduro and the Venezuelan people. He pointed out that both are honoring the life and legacy of an outstanding global leader and defender of the anti imperialist peoples. He added that Venezuela reiterates his commitment to the friendship and solidarity with Iran, remaining a faithful and constant ally. The state funeral, attended by heads of state, foreign ministers, and political representatives from different parts of the world, is headed by Mohamed Mofber, who was first vice president of the Raisi cabinet and now is the acting president. In this context, also, Venezuelan foreign minister Ivan Hill gave an exclusive interview to Iranian and Span TV media. He highlighted the country's ties with Iran and described their mutual cooperation of the last two decades as historic, while reiterating its long-term vision for relations with the Islamic nation. During the interview, the Foreign Affairs Minister further lamented the death of President Ibrahim Raisi, the Iranian Foreign Minister, and their comrades. Iran and Venezuela have had an extraordinary history of mutual collaboration. In the last 25 years and in recent times when Venezuela has been target of criminal sanctions, of unilateral coercive measures applied by the same imperialism that has applied them to Iran and that has wanted to do so much damage to our people, one of the first countries that came forward, one of the first governments that stepped forward to offer its support and corroboration was precisely the government of President Raisi. We have a unity really built on a very solid base that allows us to go beyond speeches, beyond common positions, to international scenarios in multilateral forums. It also allows us to give security to our people. Ivan Hill also pointed out the importance of solidarity between the nations, which covers key issues such as food and energy supply. Venezuela counts on Iran, Iran counts on Venezuela in all these matters, food supply, energy supply, science and technology. That is to say, we have the need to create this new collaboration. We have proven it. We have a model relationship, a relationship that goes beyond the traditional conventional diplomatic relations. We are able precisely to overcome hard times in some of the countries to stand up for each other. In India, Mumbai mourns the martyrdom of Ayatollah Raisi and his entourage, organized by Isna Hashari Jew Foundation at the Masjid Iranian Mosque on May 21, 2024. The condolence program started with a recitation of the successive verses of the Quran by Qari Mirza Hassan, a famous recitor and poet. 
The program was attended by numerous people, including dignitaries and scholars, as Maulana Sis Haider, Maulana Mohamed Karagbi, Maulana Adil, Maulana Jawar Abbas, Maulana Sheikh Shabir Reza, and many more. The religious leader, Maulana Mohamed Fayyaz Bake, delivered his first speech and enlightened the importance of Ajatullah Raisi not only for Shia Muslim but for the whole Islamic religious community. <laughs> Maulana Saki Hassan described the personality of Ajatullah Raisi and his service to humanity. He also remembered that in the martyrdom were present also two authoritative interpreters of the religious law of Islam called Mujjatid. <laughs> Maulana Kumail Asga from the Indian city of Pune started his speech with a poem attributing Raisi. The poem included verses such as, end quote, He was a star that rose from east and then got his winning center and attained the call of his lord in west. The Indian religious authority also announced that his country declared one day of a state mourning. The program concluded with the speech of a senior scholar of Mumbai, Mulana Syed Hussein Mehdi Husseini, who highlighted the importance of martyrdom for the Islamic Republic to stand strong. The religious leader recalled that when Iman Khamenei departed, all the enemies were happy. But Iman Khamenei proved that his death was to keep Islam thriving. Please take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. All the stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back. Palestine, the Israeli occupation army has reportedly committed six massacres against families in the Gaza Strip during the last 24 hours, resulting in more than 60 civilians dead. According to the Palestinian Ministry of Health, around 138 people were wounded and sent to hospital for treatment. The health entity indicated that they still do not have an exact number of the dead and wounded since they are still, they're still victims under the rubble in places of difficult access. The authorities also informed that the death toll from the Israeli genocide is now more than 35,709 and around 80,000 wounded since October 7th. In the Yemen refugee camp in the northern West Bank, the Israeli army has again launched a lethal raid. The journalist Omar Menasera shares his own experience and denounces being targeted by Israeli army shots despite his press identification. I'm the journalist Omar Menasera. We were covering the news inside the Jonin camp. We were at short distance from the entrance of the camp. We could see military equipment and bulldozers after covering the news. We proceeded to move to an Airbnb place. It was near the Jenin Public Hospital. The army was about 100 or 150 meters away from us, of course. We could see it and we tried to be visible to the military teams and let them know that we were journalists. We were the only ones in that street. Just as we arrived at the entrance to the public hospital, they began to shout at us directly. I tried to enter the hospital as did my fellow journalists. We were able to enter and I was hit by a bullet fragment. Later, they continued shooting extensively, which means that it was intentional to attack the journalists. I'm the journalist Omar Menasera. We were covering the news inside the Jonin camp. We were at short distance from the entrance of the camp. We could see military equipment and bulldozers after covering the news. We proceeded to move to an Airbnb place. It was near the Jenin Public Hospital. The army was about 100 or 150 meters away from us. Of course, we could see it and we tried to be visible to the military and let them know that we were journalists. We were the only ones in that street. 
Just as we arrived at the entrance to the public hospital, they began to shout at us directly. I tried to enter the hospital, as did my fellow journalists. We were able to enter, and I was hit by a bullet fragment. Later, they continued shooting extensively, which means that it was intentional to attack the journalists. Colombia's President Gustavo Petro ordered the opening of a Colombian embassy in Ramallah, the administrative capital of the state of Palestine. This was announced last Tuesday by the Foreign Minister of Colombia, Luis Gilberto Murillo, besides highlighting the diplomatic work of Colombia to support the Palestinian state from Latin America. This decision marks a significant step in diplomatic relations between Colombia and Palestine, strengthening the ties between both nations. Murillo also denounced the genocidal actions of the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, against the people of Palestine. The announcement of the opening of a Colombian diplomatic office in Ramallah came after the breaking of diplomatic relations with Israel on May 2nd. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak called a snap national election for July 4th, assuring that the British could choose their future with this vote. The statement was made outside Downing Street gates on Wednesday as his Conservative Party faces an uphill struggle to extend its 14 years in power. Sunak also stressed that he will fight for every vote and will demonstrate that only a libertarian government under his leadership will maintain the country's economic stability. The Prime Minister had been required to hold an election by January 2025 and had long resisted calls to be specific about his plans. However, a falling inflation rate seems to have provided the backdrop for his announcement. And South Africans go to the polls on May 29th to vote in national and provincial elections. According to the Electoral Commission, a total of 27.9 million people are registered to vote. The nation will have the opportunity to choose the leaders of the country's seventh government among the 14,903 candidates of 70 political parties and 11 independents who are running for seats in the legislative assemblies. In this context, and according to opinion polls, the African National Congress, the party in power since the first democratic elections in 1994, could for the first time lose its absolute majority in parliament and be forced to form a coalition government. China imposed sanctions on 12 U.S. military companies for selling arms to Taiwan. The Chinese Foreign Ministry said that the decision came after the unilateral and illegal sanctions imposed by the United States on several Chinese entities, citing alleged Russian-related factors. Among the 12 U.S. entities sanctions by Beijing are an aerospace and military company with large resources in advanced technology and global warfare, as well as a missile manufacturing company and a firm that provides weapon systems for strategic and tactical operations. In addition, China's foreign ministry informed that as of Wednesday, it would not issue visas and will prohibit the entry into Chinese territory to the top representative of the sanctioned companies. We have a financial break coming up, but before we invite you to join our WhatsApp community for our English speaking audience, you can scan the QR code on screen to join directly, share the link to reach more people, because the news coverage of Latin American and Caribbean as well as the rest of the world. Stay connected and informed with Telesur. Find your break, don't go away. Welcome back. The governments of Venezuela and China signed new cooperation agreements to strengthen trade, investment, and strategic development. The executive vice president of Venezuela, Delso Rodriguez, and the representative for international trade of the People's Republic of China, Wang Shouwen, signed in Caracas the agreements to strengthen bilateral relations and consolidate mutual benefits. The representatives emphasized that commercial exchanges will be consolidated through the exchange of Chinese goods for Venezuelan coffee. After the meeting, Rodriguez stressed that Venezuela will always be an ally of China because it respects international law and the growth of peoples. She also emphasized her country's intention to join the BRICS group within this year. So this is the future of relations, a giant that is also part of the BRICS. Venezuela is expecting to formally join the BRICS group this year because it is a route to the new world, to a world without hegemony, to a world that respects international law, where international trade and economic cooperation has new visions, new trade channels, new financial channels. 
which is very important. Why? Well, our economies are either blocked or threatened by hegemonic positions and the construction of this new world, of these new international financial and trade networks. Like the Silk Road, will allow us to strengthen all the common paths of our peoples based on sovereign respect between states. China's international trade representative Wang Shou Wen said the treaties with Venezuela further strengthen bilateral trade and investment relations. Today we sign a bilateral investment treaty on the basis of mutual benefits. And it is also a treaty to further encouragement development for two-way investments between the two countries. In this context, the president of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, received in Caracas the representative for international trade of the People's Republic of China, Wang Chouwen, to her with his delegation. President Maduro was accompanied among other authorities by the executive vice president, Dr. Rodriguez, and Pedro Tejeshea, oil minister. The main purpose of the visit is to strengthen strategic cooperation and the ties of brotherhood between the two countries. Nowadays, economic and trade cooperation between Venezuela and China exceeds 600 strategic agreements in several fundamental areas for the development of the two nations. In Peru, President Dina Boluarte filed a lawsuit before the Constitutional Court against the Judiciary and the Public Prosecutor's Office, accusing them of allegedly undermining the exercise of their functions and competencies. According to local media, the president argued that there was an alleged interference by both institutions of justice in her functions as president of the Republic of Peru. Likewise, the head of state appointed the Prime Minister Gustavo Adrián Sen to present the lawsuit and represent her during the process. Boluarte's decision comes in response to a new investigation announced by the Public Prosecutor's Office regarding the Ro Rolex Gate case which investigates Boluarte for the alleged crime of illicit enrichment after the purchase of luxury watches. Nearly three weeks after the city of Porto Alegre suffered from its worst floods in history, over 280,000 people are still living in shelters or in homes of friends and relatives. Our correspondent, Brian Mir, has more details. In greater Porto Alegre, home to 3.5 million residents, the floodwaters have been going down, reaching 3.9 meters above normal today. But huge swaths of the city are still underwater and other neighborhoods like Santa Teresinha, where I am right now, are surrounded by water on all sides and can only be reached by walking through knee-deep water, as I saw dozens of people do on my way here today, some of them barefoot or in flip-flops, despite the risk of leptospirosis. As the cleanup begins, residents are getting more and more angry. I've talked to several people who've lost everything they've had. The residents in this neighborhood say nobody has arrived yet to offer them any kind of help. They want to know when the money that's been pledged by the federal government is going to arrive here, and they need to make decisions about whether they want to stay here. This is the second time the neighborhood's flooded in the last six months. It's very close to the Guayba River. And if the flood contention system continues in the precarious situation that was left in through 20 years of right-wing local governments, they want to know if it's really going to be safe for them to stay here, and if not, where they're going to have to move. Currently, there's 280,000 people who are living in shelters in Porto Alegre or in houses of friends and relatives. And as they return to their homes and start doing the cleanup, assessing the damage, they want to know if they're ever going to receive damages from the criminal behavior of a local government that allowed a preventable disaster like this to happen. On Wednesday, the AI Cell Summit, co-hosted with the United Kingdom, will come to an end after debating on concerning issues regarding artificial intelligence and signing an agreement among participants. Let's see for details. The meeting is a follow-up to November's AI Safety Summit at Bletchley Park in the UK, aimed at discussing issues such as job security, copyright and inequality. In that regard, ministers expressed their views and shared their proposals. The ministerial session held today will seek more specific and practical measures based on the vision presented in the Seoul Declaration, and will especially focus on ensuring artificial intelligence safety and sustainable AI development. 
We have a joint mission to grip the risk so that we can together seize the incredible opportunities across our public services, our businesses, and our societies at large. However, my message today is that we should not rest on our laurels. As the pace of AI development accelerates, we must match that speed with our own efforts and action, if we are to grip the risks and seize the opportunities. It is our responsibility to ensure that human wisdom keeps pace with human knowledge as we navigate the most complex technology humanity has ever produced. On Tuesday, over 12 tech companies signed a voluntary agreement to enhance artificial intelligence safety including Alphabet's Google, Microsoft, Xiaomi, Amazon, Samsung Electronics, among others. They agreed on using methods as watermarking to identify AI-generated content, as well as grant job creation and support socially vulnerable groups. The PM of South Korea gave the opening remarks on the subject. The Republic of Korea is fully committed to contrib contributing to the development of safe, innovative, and inclusive AI technologies for the benefit of its citizens and the global community. AI safety cannot be truly achieved until those who are the most vulnerable have access to necessary means to respond to threats and challenges posed by this new technology. The Artificial Intelligence Seoul Summit will come to an end on Wednesday, after engaging leaders and chief executive officers of companies in talks on eye safety and inclusive eye policies among other pivotal issues. The next encounter will be held in France in 2025. At this we have come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at www.tresoenglish.net. So join us on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram and TikTok. For Tesla English, I'm with Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.